Well, good morning and welcome to South Point Church. Is anyone excited to be here this morning? Hey, we just want to say hi to all of those of you who are watching online, wherever you might be watching from. We also want to say hi to those of you in Auditorium 8. Also want to say hi to those of you here in Auditorium 12. Hey, if this happens to be your first Sunday, either in person or online, we just want to say, hey, we're really glad that you showed up today. We know that it's always a risk to visit a new church. Uh, my name is Matt, and I'm part of the team here at South Point. Hey, I want to kick off this morning and start right away. I brought something. It's an old license plate that I've kept, that I've had for several decades now. And on the license plate, it has this phrase, called Set Free. And there's a reason why I've kept this license plate for decades and decades and decades because of something that happened to me. And we're going to talk about this because it's about a principle that I believe applies to all of us regardless of where, where you're at. It doesn't matter if you kind of showed up today and you kind of have like no faith. Maybe, maybe you grew up with something different than Jesus or you've been a follower of Jesus your whole life. You see, that license plate with the word Set Free comes from something that happened to me when I was about 14 years old. And so you have to understand when I was 12 and a half, I got sent to the juvenile justice system. I was in the juvenile justice system till I was almost 17 and I was pretty much a knucklehead. And in one of these boys homes, these institutes that I was in, I'll never forget the professional sat me down and they made a statement that I will remember until the day I die. It's something they said about me uh, that kind of stuck in my soul. And here's exactly what the professionals said about me after being there for a couple of years. They said, Matt, at this pace, you won't live to see 18. And if you do, it will be behind the four walls of a, what's the word? So, I mean, how's that for some good news? Hey, we're gonna sit down, listen, uh, at this pace, you won't live to see 18. And if you happen to live to see 18, you'll most likely be behind the walls of a prison. Now, here's the crazy thing, is they were telling the truth, like, listen, I already knew I was a moron. Like, like, I got it. I knew I was deeply flawed. And I knew that I often failed when it came to things that matter. I did a bunch of knuckleheaded things. They weren't wrong. At the pace that I was going, I would barely see 18. If I did, it probably wouldn't be in the civilized world. And so, you know what? When you don't have purpose, when you, when you don't do that, you know, I, I realized something. I said, oh, like when they made that statement to me, I realized something before my 14th birthday or around my 14th birthday, I realized this truth about me. And here's the truth that I realized. My life would, what's the word? My life would fail to count because I was flawed and a failure. Listen, I get it. Like I'm wild, I'm crazy, I'm flawed, I have failures. And because I failed and because I'm flawed, my life is gonna fail to count. And here's what I know. When you have no purpose, when I have no purpose, when we feel like our life is going to fail to count right, then all that really is left is to drift through life chasing pleasure after pleasure because we really don't have a purpose because our life is going to fail to count. At least mine would because I was deeply flawed and I failed at all the things that matter. And it got me thinking, well, this is it possible that my life failing to count just doesn't apply to me? Because like, you know, what is what I've discovered over years and years of working with people? Here's what I discovered. Everyone is flawed. Nod your head and say amen. Right? Everyone's flawed. There's no such thing as perfect people. If you show up to South Point and you think you're perfect, you should run because we're going to mess you up. <laughs> right? There's no such thing as perfect people. Listen, we're all flawed and everyone has failed, right? And here's what I discovered, because all of us have flaws and because at some point all of us are gonna fail at something, there may be a season in our life where we go, my life is gonna fail to count because I'm flawed and I failed. Maybe it's not now. Maybe it's in the future for you. Maybe you showed up today and this is exactly what you were thinking. My life is gonna fail to count. You don't know my flaws and my failures. Maybe for you, this was in the past. Maybe it's a failed business. Maybe it's a failed education. You, you failed out of school and your parents aren't very happy about it. Uh, maybe it's a failed marriage. Maybe it's you feel like you failed as a parent. Maybe you failed morally or ethically. And whatever that failure, that flaw is, you believe that it's going to define you. And you go, my life is going to fail to count because I am flawed and I'm a failure. And now that I've made you feel warm and fuzzy this morning, it brings me back to why I brought my license plate that decades and decades ago that I put on my car 
called set free. Because there is some truth that our flaws and failures will lead to things that we don't want. But what if that isn't the whole story? And it leads you and it leads me, it leads us to ask a really important question today. And here's the question that we should ask. What if failures and flaws don't have, what's the word? Final. What if our flaws, what, what if my failures, what if our flaws and our failures aren't the final say in our destiny? Is it possible that just because we're flawed and just because we have failures, that doesn't have the final say in the destiny of having a life that counts. Now in a few minutes, we're gonna come back and we're gonna take a look and try to discover and answer that question. But if this is your first time or you happen to miss last week, I wanna kind of catch everyone up to speed. We're in week two of our series called What If? And we really kind of got this idea of the series, What If? And kind of from the Marvel series, which is this idea that listen, oftentimes in light, it's not in those special moments with super abilities where the trajectory, where the life change is altered. It's usually in the ordinary everyday moments. Matter of fact, last week we admitted an unspoken truth that many of us wrestle with. And I'm, I'm going to put it on the screen. And, and here it is. We often ditch our dream to have a life that counts, right? I mean, we become adults. Can I get an amen? And adulting is hard work. Somebody's got to do the dishes. Someone's got to mow the yard. Someone's got to take the kids to their game. Someone's got to go to work. Someone's got to pay the bills. Like all of a sudden adulting happens and we often ditch our dream to have a life that counts because we're ordinary people with ordinary lives, right? Like, come on, come on. 99% of us aren't going to jump in front of a bullet in front of the president of the United States, right? 99% of us are going to defuse a nuclear bomb that's going to start World War III. 99% of us are going to get on a rocket ship and stop an asteroid from causing destruction on planet Earth. Listen, 99% of us don't have some special gene that's going to stop the zombie apocalypse, right? And so we often ditch our dream to have a life that counts because we're just ordinary people who live ordinary lives. And last week, as we kicked off, what if we discovered what if that isn't true? You see, last week we admitted something that Jesus revealed to us and it's on the next slide. It's this, because we often believe that a life that counts comes from some special moment where we have a super ability, but Jesus lets us know, what if that is just one example? Matter of fact, what if that's the exception? Jesus tells us a life that counts actually comes from ordinary moments plus being, what's the word? Selfless actions. Jesus comes and tells us, listen, everyday ordinary people can live a life that counts because you live in ordinary moments where you can have selfless actions. And that's how life counts. Now, if you missed last Sunday, don't worry, this today's will stand alone. But if you want to catch up, you can go onto our website or you can go to our YouTube channel. I encourage you to subscribe because it drops every week. And then you can watch on demand and catch up. But there is a question that regardless of where you're at with Jesus, whether you're kind of here checking him out, you grew up with something other, you've been a follower, here's a question I think every single one of us is going to face at some point in our life. And here's the question that we want to try to answer today. How do we, how do you, how do I, how do we keep our failures and flaws? Because the reality is, is when we walk through the door, we all realize that everyone has failed and everyone has flaws. How do we keep failures and flaws from derailing our destiny to have a life that counts? Because without a life that counts, we, we ditch our dream and we drift through life chasing pleasure after pleasure because we have no purpose. And this is why I've taken all the tips of my life. And I've just, I put them all in. All the tips of my life in are on following Jesus, God, and the Bible. Like I just bet my whole life on that. Because here's why. God knew. God knew that every person in every culture and every generation will struggle with this question. Matter of fact, when Jesus shows up, this is what Jesus often addresses the most. The flaws and the failures of people. Will it define their destiny? And the answer that Jesus gives us should make you fired up and be excited. It's why we start off the services with singing and telling how God, how great he is because of the answer to this question that Jesus gives us. So we're going to take a look at an eyewitness account. It happens in the eyewitness account of the gospel of Luke, right? Luke 10. And we're going to kind of pick up how Jesus actually encounters a person who is a massive failure and who is deeply flawed. I mean, this person, I mean, they failed pretty big and their flaws 
are actually very obvious to everyone around them. So we pick it up in the eyewitness account of the gospel, uh, Luke, Luke 5. It says, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Now I want to stop here because whenever I talk about Levi sitting at his tax booth, you know what most people in America think? That's the IRS guy. That's the guy that like audits our taxes. You know, we think of someone with glasses sitting at the end of the computer with like a little calculator. We think of kind of that person. But you have to understand something. That is the furthest thing from who Levi was. You see, Levi was a tax collector. And in the Jewish nation of Israel, they had been conquered by the Roman army. And nobody wants their homeland to be conquered by a foreign army. And so what Levi did is he was a traitor to his country and he collected and stole money from his fellow neighbors to pay the taxes to the Rome and to make himself wealthy. I tried to think of a word that would make you and I kind of think of what Levi was thought of by the people around him. And so the closest thing I get would, could get, get to was he was a Nazi collaborator. If you just put in, Jesus went out and saw a Nazi collaborator, you would get kind of the, the visceral feeling of what was going on in that moment. And there are two other things that I love about this. First is Jesus went out and it reveals the truth that a cause worth giving your life to never happens in a comfort zone. Jesus left the comfort and convenience of heaven to come to a busted and broken world to tell people that they matter deeply to God. He went out. Second, he saw. I mean, that was most of our message last week is that most of us are very fortunate to be born with sight, but not very many of us see. Jesus had a vision for Levi that he didn't have for himself. And then Jesus utters the words that I think caused everyone's jaw to drop that was surrounding him. He said, follow me, Jesus said to him. And you have to understand, anytime a rabbi asks you to follow them, he is inviting you to join a cause. He has selected you. Many people didn't get that selection. Matter of fact, most people just went into trades. But if a rabbi asked you to follow them, man, you got to apprentice. You were the big deal. You had purpose. Jesus says, follow me, said to him. And then Levi got up and left everything and followed him. And I love what this encounter with Levi, the Nazi collaborator, a traitor who was a thief. Jesus looks at him and says that you are sacred because every man, woman, and child is made in the image of God. And that's offensive to some people. But the other truth is, is that if we say yes to Jesus, it requires surrender. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. And I bet the audience, when Jesus invited Levi to follow him, was stunned. You called that guy? And then I love what, hap what happens next. is awesome. Look what happens next. It says this. It says, then Levi held, what's the word? Y'all are the second service. <laughs> Levi held a what? Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. Now listen, Levi didn't hold a lame second class banquet for Jesus. And the reason I say that is we often give our leftovers or lameness to Jesus, but Levi gave his best. He held this great banquet for Jesus's house. And it says a large crowd of, what is that? The tax collectors and others were eating with them. The only other people that would associate with the collaborators, the traitors and the thieves were other busted and broken. This was a who who's of not to ha how to hang out with. I mean, this was the unsafe savory crowd of the day. And Levi held a great banquet and Jesus was hanging out with them. I love it. It was a party with a purpose. That's what Sunday is. It's a party with a purpose that we are never going to make lame because Jesus is here and we want our friends to see Jesus the way we do. I love that. I mean, what's the first thing he do, does after Jesus? He says, listen, I'm going to invite my friends, but it costs them something. Because he had surrendered, he invited Jesus. And we see this isn't the most popular thing because it doesn't end here. It says this, but the Pharisees, he just put church folk in there. You know the kind I'm talking about, the people that are never happy. Right? They're just always mad. It's always someone's fault. They just can't wait to hit somebody with a scripture. Like this, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to a sect, they, what's the word? They complain, man, church folk, we could, we could learn something from that, right? They complain to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? They're saying, listen, I don't get why you're hanging out with those people. Now, I just want to stop here for a second. Because every single person has a picture of who those people are. And let's just be clear. Jesus died on the cross for all people, including those people, whoever those people are to you. 
And I love the response of Jesus. Look what Jesus says. Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I mean, isn't that what John 3, 16 and 17 tell us? For God so what? God so loved the world that he came and he gave his one and only son that so people wouldn't perish but could have life. But no one ever rarely says what verse 17, for the son of man did not come into the world to condemn church, if we could grab a hold of that. Jesus didn't come to condemn, Jesus came to save. And here's what I discovered. Because everyone is flawed and because everyone failed, there are no perfect people. We are all equal at the foot of the cross. And what I love is that Jesus does something miraculous. I mean, you should be, like, if you're online or you're in theater, eight or you're, you should be, like, fired up. You want to know why? Because your flaws and my flaws and our failures do not define us. They are not final. I mean, here was a guy who had some deep flaws, and he had massively failed, yet it didn't keep him from having a purpose and a destiny. God called him to something bigger, and here's some great news. There is something bigger than your flaws and your failures, and it's not politics. Can I get an amen? There's something bigger than your failures or flaws, and it's not education. Can I get an amen? There's something bigger than your failures or flaws, and it's not technology. Can I get an amen? You know what it is? It's a person, and his name is Jesus. He is bigger than our failures and our flaws. And I love what Jesus teaches us in this. And listen, if you, listen, like, I need everyone to lean in. Like if you're online or you're in theater, I need you to lean in. Do not miss this because if you understand this, it will transform the way that you live and it will transform your life. Here's what Jesus demonstrates this principle right here on the screen. It's this right here. Jesus doesn't just save us. What's the word? Jesus doesn't just save us from something. Does Jesus save us from something? Absolutely. See, come on, come on now. When we decide to live life our own way, we basically stiff arm God and say, God, yep, you know, I might even believe in you. I might even know about you, but I'm going to stiff arm you. I'm going to live life my own way. And when we push God away because God is love and he says, listen, love never forces. I'm going to give you what you want. And when God withdraws from your life, you get hellish results. And then when God finally comes back and we say we didn't want anything, he's going to separate himself from us. That is called hell. We absolutely need to be saved for something. And the great news is Jesus died on the cross and the tomb is empty. He did save us from something, but he didn't just save us. Come on, second service. Jesus didn't just save us from something. Jesus saves us to something. He didn't just save Levi from being a wrecked and ruined human being who was a tax collector and a traitor and a thief. He didn't just save him from hellish behavior and a hellish life with no purpose that was all about his pleasure. He didn't just save him from that. He saved them to something. He gave him purpose and a meaning and a life. He gave him a destiny. What if you aren't meant to be just saved from something? You were made to be saved to something. And I promise you, if you grab a hold of this, it'll transform your life. And all the professionals who told you that your flaws and your failures would cause you to die or end up in prison will fall on deaf ears because there's one who conquered hell and death and the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead can live in you. And you won't be just saved from something. You'll be saved to something. But make no mistake, it costs Levi to follow Jesus. And we're going to get to that in a second. So what I'd like to do is, is this is the principle that will help us understand what Jesus says. And so there are three principles that if you'll grab a hold of this, I'm telling you, your life will be radically different. And the day that they celebrate your life, that day that you're in a casket, will be dramatically different if you understand these three principles that Jesus teaches us from this encounter with a guy named Levi who was deeply flawed and who had massively failed. And here's principle number one. We're gonna put it up on the screen. It's this. God has a plan for your life. If you're not dead, God's not. Somebody should get fired up and say Amen. Listen, God has a plan for your life. You might go, Matt, I don't, you don't know me. You don't know my flaws. You don't know my failures. And you're right. I don't know. And you may have some crazy flaws. And you may have done some really bad things that are failures. But I've got great news. So did Levi. But God had a plan. And here's why God has a plan for your life. Because it's not whether you make the grade or you have the goods. It comes down to the grace of God found in a person named Jesus. 
See, here's the great thing. God has a plan for your life. If you're not dead, God's not done. Listen, God called Moses at 80. So even if you're old, you ain't got no excuse. You see, we often in our world think that purpose and value is brought because we make the grade and we have the goods to deliver. And the great news is, is Levi didn't have any of those things. He definitely didn't make the grade and he didn't have the goods. Yet in grace, God gave him and had a plan for his life. You know why? Because Jesus saw him. You see, oftentimes all we see when we look in the mirror, when no one else is around, right? Like, out in the world, we'll beat our chest and we'll tell everyone we're awesome and how great we are. But when we're alone in private, we'll look in the mirror and we'll go, yep, I know that flaw that no one else can see. Yep, I remember the failures that have created harm in my life and the life of others. And the thing is, all we see is our flaws and our failures. But here's the great news. Our Heavenly Father sees something beyond that. See, here's the amazing thing. God doesn't see us as we are. God sees us as we can be. You were meant to be a daughter or a son of the Most High. You have a destiny. Ephesians tells us, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, don't you know, you are God's masterpiece and God created good works in advance for you to do. God has a plan for your life, not because you make the grade, not because you have the goods, but because of his grace found in Jesus. And you might be going, well, how does God have a plan for me? Because it's so simple. The goal isn't to be great. Y'all, y'all, about to, y'all about to get preached on. <laughs> the goal isn't for any of us to be great. It's to love people greatly. See, that's the thing is we all want to be great. And the thing is, Jesus says, you don't need to be great. You just need to love greatly. Put God first and then love your neighbors yourself. In ordinary moments, be selfless and you will create a legacy that is life changing. You'll be a part of God's plan for your life because God sees who you can become and who you were meant to be. Do not let the world, the enemy of your soul or your brokenness lie to you. You are a child of God. That is the destiny that God has for you. If you you refuse that, God will never force you. But that's what God wants for you. He has a plan for your life and he sees where you could be. I'm grateful God saw me when I was 14. True story. My wife and I moved here in 1998 to start an organization called Young Life. It works with high school and middle school students. So we were just kicking it. It didn't exist here in the county. Uh, our job was to start it right. So we had uh, about 30 high school students in our basement. And, you know, sing songs, talk a little bit about Jesus and how to throw a party for Jesus, where we would invite people, right? And um, everyone there was in high school still. Most of them were young. Most of them were sophomores or juniors, um, kind of in that age bracket. But there was one, one student who was there. They were a senior. They had already graduated. And they kept coming. And I was like, man, they're not getting the point. This is not for graduated people. This is for for high school students. So finally, you know me, I'm really shy, right? Like you can tell that about me. Uh, So I went to this person and I said, hey, listen, uh, you've graduated high school. This is for high school students. You can't come anymore. It's awkward and weird. Like, you know, this is for high school students. You're out of high school. Like, sorry, you can't be here. Well, a couple weeks later, uh, I got a call from someone that I knew who's a friend, and they said, hey, you knew that person you asked to stop coming? I was like, yeah, I asked them to stop coming. I said, here's why. And they said, hey, listen, I think they would make a great leader. I've seen them do these things. And I said, are you sure? Like, I don't know. And they said, sure. So I invited this person to be a leader. And this person turned out to be one of the best volunteer leaders that I've ever led in my entire life. I was on Young Life staff for 10 years. This person has been working with Young Life for almost 20 And by the way, they are a way better Young Life leader than I ever was. All because someone saw them differently than I saw them. The same way that when Jesus went up to Levi and all that everyone else saw was a collaborator and a traitor and a thief, Jesus had the sight to be able to see him for who he was meant to be. And if you're here today, I want you to know that your heavenly father sees past your flaws and past your failures And he has a plan for your life because he knows who you were meant to be. The second thing, not only does God have a plan for our life, but that plan is this. God's heart is for what? God's heart is for people, man. Like, I think sometimes when we say yes to Jesus, we think our job is to be showy, religious. Like, we're supposed to, like, you know, like wear WWJD bracelets and, like, only listen to Christian radio music and carry, like, a big Bible around and, like, use weird language around people. You know, like, brother and sister, like, I don't know you, right, you know? And so, like, we use weird language like that, and, like, people are like, man, what, what is going on with you? And so the idea of when we say yes to Jesus isn't showy religiosity. It is serving in love. See, God's heart is for 
people. See, instead of insulating ourselves, we invite and invest uh, in others. Here's the crazy thing, and I don't know where this came from, but church people are really good at this. Can I get an amen? My, myself included. I was there at one time, right? See, something happens. We say yes to Jesus, and all of a sudden, we cut off all of our old friends, right? And we join a new clique, and we think we're really special. We go, those people. And the reason we say those people is because people, we think, create problems. And here's what Jesus tells us. People aren't the problem. People are the purpose. Can I get an amen? Let me say that one more time. At South Point Church, people matter deeply to God. And because people matter deeply to God, they matter deeply to us. We're going to throw a great party because our purpose is Our purpose is people. And this is exactly what Levi did. He threw a great party and instead of cutting off all of his old friends, he created space for them to see Jesus. And he knew it cost him something because he was like, oh man, dude, you surrendered to Jesus. I don't know about all that. And then all the religious folks says, look at who you're hanging around. You know, we think you might be sacred, but now we don't know you're hanging around those people. So it cost Levi something, but God's heart is for people. That's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He didn't run from people. He came for people. I think sometimes in church we get it wrong. The goal isn't to be religious, to be weird. The goal is people. The goal isn't to cut them off. The goal is to create space that they, so they can see Jesus. Never forget, true story, I was doing Young Life and every once in a while I'd get some complaints. Remember how we said complaint, the religious people, you know, the church folk, they complain. Every once in a while, I get a parent, and they would they'd sit down and talk to me. They go, Matt. And I go, yeah. And they go, man, my kid really loves being in your life. I'm like, that's awesome. Great. And they're like, but we got a problem. I'm like, uh-oh, what, what are we going to talk about now? They're like, hey, they're hanging out with those kids. And I'm like, excuse me? Those kids? What do you mean? You know, those kids. Those kids that do wild and crazy things. I go, yeah, I know. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, my kids, like, they follow Jesus. They go to church. I need to protect them. You shouldn't let those kids hang out at Young Life. And then I just, I, I you know, I do a, oh, my God. Hi, first of all, can I just ask a quick question, parent? Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, do they go to public school? Yeah. Oh, so they already hang out with them in school. You just don't, aren't aware of it. Uh-huh. And my kid would never hang out with them or do anything. I go, uh-huh. <laughs> if you only knew, parents. And then I stop and I ask him, well, is that what Jesus did? I mean, you are a Christian. You go to church and you say you follow Jesus, but didn't Jesus leave the comfort of heaven? Didn't Jesus come and hang out with busted and broken people? Jesus didn't insulate himself with religious people. Instead, he went out and he invited and he invested people. And that's exactly what the disciples did. That's exactly what Levi did. He threw a party with the purpose. And the purpose wasn't to have a fancy party. The purpose was because people matter deeply to the heart of God. And this is what we always wrestle with at South Point is that all people, Every man, woman, and child is made in the image of God. They are sacred. But that doesn't mean we always agree with all the behaviors and choices that people make. And the flip side is to say yes to Jesus requires surrender. And so what I've discovered here at South Point when I say we're for people because everyone's sacred, some of the religious uptight people are like, oh, I don't like that. And then when I say, listen, following Jesus requires surrender, other people on the outside go, well, I don't know if I want to surrender that thing. And I go, well, it's a no-win situation, but I'm for because Jesus is for people. And our purpose isn't to be great. It's to love greatly. Now, the next one I got almost booed at at the, at the first service. So, like, no one's going to like me for the next, next one. You guys are going to be like, oh, man, this is like, I hate you right now. But it's true. Like, here, here's, here's, here's the third principle that's so important. God-given purpose is a call that includes a? I love how Pastor Craig Rochelle says this. Is we can't fulfill our calling in our? See, many of us, we want to change the world on our couch, on our Twitter account. Man, I made it. You should see that Facebook post. Man, you know millions of people have been saved through Facebook posts. The reality is, is that purpose includes a cost. And if you don't believe me, just ask Jesus. Jesus' purpose was to redeem mankind, and it came at the cost of his own blood on the cross. 
Levi, when he held this party, it cost him his time. It cost him his money. He didn't throw a lame party. He didn't throw a skimpy party. He threw a great banquet for Jesus who's going to conquer hell and death. And he knew it would cost him with the religious elite because the wild and crazy people there. And he knew it would cost him with the wild and crazy people because he had surrendered to Jesus. He knew it was costly, but he knew that his purpose was worth the cost. And here's the reality. You can't be a part of a cause that makes a difference cheaply. It just doesn't work that way. And in America, we all want to be a part of a cause that costs us nothing, especially church folk. We will never fulfill our calling in our comfort zone. I'll never forget a story I heard about Dr. Martin Luther King on one of his marches across the Selma Bridge. He was talking to a group of people who were going to march for civil rights, that regardless of the color of your skin, the language you speak, or the money that you have in your bank account, you are meant to be a child of God. And that is a truth that still holds true from the beginning of time until the end of time. And he began to tell the crowd, I want you to count the cost because on the other side of the bridge, there's going to be some dogs and there's going to be some supremacists with clubs and there's going to be fire hoses and they're going to beat you and spit on you and they're going to have dogs attack you. It's going to cost you to stand up that all people are made in the image of God, that all people matter deeply to the heart of God. And then they locked arms and they walked across the bridge and it cost them something to stand and say that people matter deeply to the heart of God. Church, we can't sit in chairs or in pews on Sunday morning and tweet and have Facebook posts and think we're creating change. The goal isn't to be great. The goal is to greatly love. We'll never fulfill our calling and our comfort zone. It costs us something. I mean, Levi, it cost him everything. It says he left everything to follow Jesus. And this is the part that's great news. What I love about Jesus, if I was going to sum it up, I'd sum it up this way. What Jesus teaches us, because of Jesus, not because of Pastor Matt, not because of religiosity or church, not because of America or politics, not because of the money in your bank account, not because of education or technology, but because of a person named Jesus, no one, can I get an amen? No matter how you walk through these doors today, no matter what your past, your future is, because of Jesus, no one has to be disqualified from their destiny to live a life that counts. The tomb is empty. Your future can be secure. But God will never force you Because love always requires a choice. I was thinking about how how I I close this. I mean, regardless of our flaws and regardless of our failures, you mean God God has a plan for us? That plan is just simple. It's just love people? Like, I mean, but it's going to cost me something? I mean, anyone? This past Wednesday, we had vision night at our new building. Was anybody there? It was awesome. Yeah, get fired up. Everyone keeps asking me, we're going to get in the building. And I go, I don't know. There's too many variables, so please don't ask me. But we were there for a vision night, casting vision of an amazing party where people can see Jesus in this building. And then we could send people out as a launch pad, right? And I was in there. And then after the meeting, one of the staff said, do you realize that you gave your first talk and your first verse off the stage in that building this Wednesday? Can you get fired up? And I literally almost started crying. I was like, man, that is awesome. But that story started decades and decades ago with a kid who'd been told, you won't live to see 18 and you won't live to see outside the walls of four prison. I was probably about 17, maybe even 16, now almost 17. And I walked into a church a lot like South Point. It was meeting, it was meeting in a school. And if you think the chairs in Leonardtown were hard, you should have seen these uncomfortable chairs. And it was a church made up of all kinds of people. And they had a very simple message that there's a God who made you and a God who loves you and a God who died for you and a God who has a plan for you. And somehow I heard the truth that God didn't just save me from something, the hell that I was living in, the hell that I was experiencing, that God actually saved me to something. And then I prayed the most dangerous prayer I think anyone can ever pray. I remember exactly where I was. I said, God, What if you could use someone who's as flawed and who has failed as much as me? And God answered my prayer. 
He took me out of the trash heap. And I wonder often why God took someone who is moronic and busted and broken as me because I have flaws still. I fail still. But yet, how did I get here? And here's why. Like, this is, this is really good for you. I think God took me out of the trash heap so that he could say, listen, if I could do with that moron, imagine what I could do with you. I think he takes the busted and broken and says, if I can do it in his life, imagine if we say yes to Jesus, what God can do in our life. Because no one has to be defined by their flaws or failures. Instead, we can be defined by the words of Jesus who said, come, follow me. So I have three simple challenges for you today. Maybe you showed up online or in person or in theater eight, right? And you're really kind of just checking out this Jesus thing. Maybe you grew up with other faith. Maybe you even believe in God. Maybe you even know about God, but you've never surrendered. You're like the Levi sitting at the booth. You know about God. You may even believe in God, but you really haven't surrendered. Jesus has been saying, come follow me. And today I want to challenge you. Today is the day to say yes to Jesus. I promise you I have zero regrets for putting all my chips in to follow Jesus. Zero. Today would be the day where you can surrender. And it's so simple. You just admit, listen, I'm busted, I'm broken. I got flaws and I failed. And believe that Jesus, when he stretched out his arms and said, Father, forgive them. And because his tomb is empty, you are forgiven. You are adopted back into the family of God. And then you turn and you commit, not to perfection, but to following Jesus. If you're here today and you've never surrendered, today would be a day to do that. There are others of you here. You've been going to church for a really long time. And you're living in your comfort zone. What matters to you is your convenience, your comfort, your politics, your wealth, your house, your stuff, your things. And you're hoping that God will use you, but you just want to do it from the comfort that is easy, that costs you nothing. And I just want to ask you, would you be willing to surrender to Jesus and step outside of your comfort zone? What would it look like for you to lock arms with other followers of Jesus who step out of their comfort zone and head into busted and broken places that are messy and it's hard and it isn't easy so that people can see Jesus and that there's a God who loves them. Wherever you're at on that spectrum, I encourage you to know that no matter what your flaws are or no matter the failures that you've had, God has a plan for your life. What if today you prayed that prayer. God, what if you used me? What if you fulfilled your destiny and lived a life full of purpose where you didn't have to just chase the next pleasure and experience life and life to the full? Let me pray. God, you rock. I can't imagine God. God, Jesus, you left the comfort of heaven and the convenience of heaven, God. And God, instead of just seeing our flaws and our failures and all of our brokenness, which is so obvious, God, you chose to see us as we were meant to be, Jesus as we could be. And then God, you paid the ultimate price your son paid to redeem us. And God, you don't just save us from something, you save us to something, to purpose, to meaning, to a destiny that is not great, but where we can greatly love and our lives can count. That is amazing, God that we can have a destiny. God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that are open so that we can make you smile and so we can fulfill the plan that you have for our lives. This is our hope and our prayer. In Jesus' name, and all who agreed said, amen.